Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Just to preface this, I have been dealing with a sinus sinus headache or tension headache slash sinus infection thing for the last two days. And I've just pushed off this video for way too long. And so I'm just gonna try and plow through it today. Hopefully I can do her justice because this has been a long time coming. So obviously, as you can tell by the title, I am collaborating with Bunny today, AKA Amanda. And if you guys don't know who Amanda is, you might be new to this channel because I talk about her, I feel like in almost every video. She is an amazing friend. She's an amazing grower. She supplies lots of people with plants, but she does it very privately. And uh, she's got this mysterious element about her that I really love. But the thing about Amanda is actually, um, between our friendship, we're we're an open book and i think there's so much about her and her relationship with plants that should be shared with everyone but she is very private and so um i feel like this is a way for her to like get some of this information and goodness out into the world and so i'm really excited and like honored to be the one to do it so thank you amanda for doing this with me um i wish you know i could have been there in person to do this collab with her but it just it wouldn't have worked out anyway. So I opened up my Instagram questions a couple months ago to questions for Amanda and so many came in. I think I got close to like 150 questions. So there were some that were very, <laughs> what I thought were a bit invasive. Um, you know, they wanted like a full like house tour, like every room and stuff. And she does value her privacy. And so I've kind of filtered out the comments that I felt were appropriate for her to answer. And ones that I thought would be helpful for you guys in terms of growing plants and growing Anthurium specifically. So I have 32 questions that I have asked her. She has sent some voice notes. She sent videos. She sent photos. So I'm really excited to be able to share that with you today. And I'm not like a hundred percent sure how today is gonna go to be honest because I've got my laptop here right next to me um, I'm gonna be listening to the voice notes as I play it um, Over the video because I just need to kind of like refresh my memory on what she said I need to go through the photos that she sent so that I can kind of talk them through with you guys but I also am gonna be doing a bit of like repotting and uh chopping and I just have a few things that I need to tend to all in Ethereum, obviously because it's an Amanda video so I had to do my Ethereum. so um, it might be a bit of a chaotic filming day I'm just kind of warning you now I, I just felt like it would have been a little weird for me to just like sit down and while I'm playing the voice notes I'm just like sitting there doing nothing so I just thought I should be like kind of doing something with my hands so that while we're like talking through some of her answers, um, I have some pretty plans to show you too. So anywho, I'm gonna show you the roster. It's a pretty good mix of plants of like rehabs. I have a new import, plants that just need to be sized, sized up in terms of pots. So who should I start with? Um, first one up is my Anthurium Dark Phoenix. And I really am hesitatingly showing this to you guys today because it has been like the most sad like pathetic thing ever i'm kind of over it the catafil has already rotted and i think i have a decent stem to work with from my recollection so i'm just going to chop it into pieces because i chopped the bottom of this plant a couple months ago and a new leaf came out it went to my friend jesse and i'm just like you know what i don't need I don't need this anymore like looking at this makes me sad so i'm gonna chop it up into a few pieces hopefully if i can get three that's my like happy number i would love to have two uh cuttings of this and then maybe sell one just because it's like an amazing plant or i might just give it to alice because i think i think she mentioned she was like interested in having a cutting of mine i can't remember but in any case Getting it out of this, uh, completely chopping it up, and we're gonna start over. The next one is a bunny plant. So sorry for the weird setup. I have like pre-prepped what everything is gonna go in. So this is my papilla pap. Oh my God. This is my papillolaminum RA5 uh, swamp bunny, and it came with these two leaves when she sent it to me. This is the one that I got 
um, a few months ago. I have another one from her. She sent me a backup because the other one that I have was being a bit naughty. It's kind of acting right now, but this one has definitely been so much easier. So this leaf grew in my care and I was, I showed this on Instagram and was just saying how like, how nice it is to be growing my plants right now with no spider mites because you just have these leaves that like look like this and it's like I knew like I knew I was capable of growing leaves like this but I feel like with the spider mite thing it's just set me back pretty much all year and it has just made me feel like such honestly like a failure of a plant parent because every new leaf that has so much promise it's like it hardens and I'm like, oh, it's covered in spider mites. So this has been really, really refreshing. Um, it's nice to kind of see a, a little bit of the size jump and it's already pushing another leaf, which is why I wanted to get this repotted right, like right away. It's in this little pot here and whoa, why is it all blown out? It's in this little pot and I do want to get it into a pot with drainage holes and in a pot a slightly bigger. I don't see a massive root system. I do see lots of nice new roots. Like you can see it down there, but I don't wanna go too much bigger. So my sweet friend Yuko, she um, dropped off. So she came over one weekend and she like gave me her Monstera Oreo, which was like so incredibly nice of her. And she gave me all of these glass vessels and she was like, hey, I want you to try these out. She makes these like, little pots i don't think she sells them or anything i think it's really just for her but she was nice enough to be like yeah like try it out if you like it you like it and so yeah she gave me a few versions of these like deli cups that have oh my god my nasty fingerprints are all over it um these deli cups with holes that it looks like she has created herself so i think this is going to be perfect because you can see it's like not like a lot bigger than the pot that it was in before but like big enough and uh, like I mentioned in another video, I am going to eventually, and I'm slowly doing it, I'm moving all of my anthurium to pots with drainage. I have a few anthurium that have done completely fine in pots without drainage. Alice grows in pots without drainage. Lauren grows in pots without drainage. But I'm not like as comfortable with Ethereum as they are. And I feel like I've been really, really holding back on the fertilization basically forever. Um, I, I know that I'm not fertilizing enough and that's because I'm so hyper aware of the fact that there are no drainage holes. And there was one time where I was like, you know what? My, my anthurium deserve a good like fertilization. Um, so I used, and it was kind of a, a lapse in judgment because I had such little experience with it, but I used TPS silica for the first time, or maybe it was the second time I had used it. And so many of my anthurium with no drainage holes just turned like this bright yellow around the edges, like almost the next day. So um, it's just been, better for me to grow with drainage holes because I can be a little, I guess, less careful and I can be a bit more heavy on my fertilization and hopefully I'll see like a lot more size growth than I have been historically. Not to say that I don't think it can, can't can work without drainage holes. Like I mentioned, I know plenty of people who do it and do it successfully. I just don't feel like that route has been working for me. So anyway, all that said, a lot of these are moving into pots. Actually, all of these are moving into pots with drainage. Um, the next one is one of my Anthurium uh, seed. Oh, I can't really even call it a seedling anymore because look how big they are. It was last year, I think, where I hybridized my Crystal Mag with my with a friend's Dark Forgetty Eye. This freaking light is blinding me. It keeps moving. I have a Soltec light up there and it like, I think it's loose, the the hinge on my clamp light and it keeps just slowly like dropping down and I'm like finding myself getting blinded. Anyway, so like I was saying, I hybridized those two plants and I only kept two from that seedling batch and they look so different. But I'm glad that I kept this one because as a really, really young plant, it showed a lot differently. Wait, no, it showed a lot different <laughs> it showed really different characteristics on this specific plant than the rest of my seedlings did. I will say that like 80% of the seedlings kind of looked 
really, really crystal mag and you didn't really see a lot of that forgetty eye besides like the really round shape of it. This one as a young plant, like pretty much by, I want to say like the fifth leaf on it when it was still really small, it just had like the cutest little sinus and um, it was like really red and sort of like protruding. And not only that, the venation was not as silvery as the rest of my seedlings. The leaf was darker and in general, it just looked a lot different. And so I'm happy I kept this one because it's turning out to be such a little gem. I don't know if you can tell like how sort of like pebbly it is. I, I knew that it was going to be a bit pebbly once I saw this leaf because you can see it but it has really, really come through with this new leaf. And again, the venation is not, it's not silvery like the Crystal Mag. It very much has like the dark forgetty eye venation. Um, I thought that it was gonna keep this sort of like partially fused sinus, but it looks like it's like opening up now. Who knows what it's gonna keep looking like, but this has easily become one of my favorites. And I don't know if it's because it's the first time I've ever like bred an Ethereum, but I don't know. I feel like if I saw this in a purge or I saw this at Lauren's shop, I would have like wanted to buy it right away. And I definitely like it more than the other plant that I kept from that, that batch. I mean, it's still a cool plant in itself. Like it doesn't look quite crystal mag. Like you could tell it's a hybrid, but it's not as cute as this one. Like this one is like my pride and joy from that batch. And I'm just like so happy to have it. So anyway, um, this one is also pushing another leaf, which is why this video had to happen today. It is super, not root bound in here, but it can definitely use a size up. So I'm going to be potting it into another one of Hugo's pots. This one is designed a bit differently. You can see it's got like the holes up and down and also at the bottom. And um, it's, not, it's not that much bigger than this pot but it'll definitely have some space to move around. Next one is uh, a plant that has always kind of struggled in my care. This one was actually a much larger plant when I received it from Amanda. So this is her Anthurium Magnificum Luxuriens. So when I first got this plant, it was in no drainage. And then I moved it to a pot with drainage and it just like dried out so fast. So I put it back in no drainage and it finally gave me another leaf, but I just don't feel like it's happy. I mean, I can kind of see that it's looking a little pregnant, like it looks like it's going to push something soon, but I'm not seeing like the root growth that I would expect to see on a plant this old. Like I'm pretty sure if you asked Alice to show you her Mag Lux, I think she has one, uh, her Mag Lux from Amanda, it's probably like, I don't know, like freaking flowering size already. I just don't think it's happy in here. I do kind of want to see what's going on with the stem. I want to see what's going on with the roots. And I just overall want to kind of give it an inspection because it's been kind of a long time since I've um, repotted that plant. The next one is an Ethereum, an Ethereum Red Crystallinum, also from Amanda. And she sent this one to me recently. This is my second try at growing a red crystal. Uh, it did push out a new leaf recently, but it was like this tiny and it just stayed that tiny until it died. I'm not really loving the substrate that this is in. I put it in like a very like mossy pond mix and it looks like there's a bit of tree fern fiber. I think I just don't want to do the moss thing at all with Ethereum. I thought that maybe it would have a better transition if it was like in a mossy tree fern fiber mix, but I just think it's retained way too much water. I would not be surprised if there was like a secondary growth point that was starting to shoot out of this thing because I noticed that with my Anthurium that are kind of struggling, it tends to like activate an auxiliary bud, I think out of like fight or flight mode. So I'm gonna dig this up and I bet you there's like another growth point that's activating. I don't plan on chopping it, none of that. I just wanna get it out of here. Next guy up is this Anthurium papillolaminum portili, port portier. Uh, this one is another Amanda plant. This one was in Alice's care. She chopped it and gave me a cutting. So this was the original leaf on it. This one is gonna be chopped off today. But this one grew in my care and it's a cute little thing. I mean, it's a good size for being like a mid, like a mid cut or a bottom cut. 
so I'm happy with it. Um, looks spider mite free, but it's just in tree fern fiber right now. Not that there's anything wrong with growing in tree fern fiber, but I just think the vessel is a bit too small. And again, I want to get it into a pot with drainage. Also, I forgot to mention that my friend Jesse, well, I should say our friend Jesse, he was a like a nice surprise in terms of like friends that I've made this year through Lauren at her shop. And um, Jesse is just amazing. He is like one of the sweetest guys and just like good, like the one of the best guys I've ever met my whole life. And like, he's just a breath of fresh air and I just love being around him. I love talking to him. And uh, yeah, he, he said, he like always hypes me up and is like, oh, I'm doing this because you do this. And I watched you do this in, in this video. And so I did this, but you know what, Jesse, Jesse is the one that should be making videos because that guy is a freaking beast growing plants. I got to collab with Jesse one day. Jesse, I'm coming over. I'm going to show them all of your plants because they're insane. So his method, he sizes up Ethereum like, like it's no one's business. And his method is that he sizes up when he's repotting. He goes like from a four inch pot to like basically a bucket. And I'm like not really even exaggerating either. He literally has some plants that are in literal buckets. And that goes against every rule they tell you in like the plant parenthood manuscript. Even like for me when I'm giving advice to people and this is even now I'm, I'm always like, you know, you can size up, but don't go too big because you run the risk of having things like root rot if there's way too much moisture in like the substrate and the root system is too small and it just like stays wet for too long. These rules don't apply to Jesse for some reason. And um, his Ethereum just size up so fast. So I am going to try the Jesse method with a few of these and I'm gonna try and go like two or three sizes bigger. And here's an example of one. So. This is my um, Luxurians Ralph Lynam Fort Sher Sherman. This has to be probably my favorite Lux hybrid right now. And it wasn't my favorite Lux hybrid until I saw it recently at Lauren's shop. She did a pre-order with Amanda and she sent these like bigger specimens of these. And I was like, what is that? I need it in my life. It's the most beautiful Lux hybrid I've ever seen. And Alice was like, yeah, well, this is kind of awkward because you already have one. <laughs> So um, I want to give this one more love. This one is in the tiniest little parfait cup. So I'm going to be sizing it up into this guy. We're going from this to this. And normally this would be like a no-no for me. This is a little bit too much of a size jump for my comfortability level. But my consolation right now is that I discovered over the weekend that my Ethereum cabinet actually gets really freaking hot. So my Ethereum cabinet now is the Millsville wide. I have it in my living room. I mean, once winter comes, it shouldn't be as bad, but we're still getting some like occasional sunny days and the light just beats on that thing and it gets hot, like hotter than my tent. I was so surprised. Everything was drying out so fast in there and I like just didn't know why because I had never really gone in there during like the peak of the heat. So I am feeling a bit better about moving some of these to larger vessels because I know that like things are evaporating, plants are photosynthesizing and like it's actually going to be used. And so I'm, I'm feeling okay, honestly, even when it's not sunny in there, just the three lights that I have in there is keeping it warm enough. So we're going to just give that a whirl today because what is the fun? of plants if you cannot experiment and f and find out yourself what you like and don't like. Anywho, uh, the last guy, sorry, I should have waited to do that on camera because that was very satisfying. I just saw it and I had to rip it off. The last one is uh, a new acquisition and I said that I wasn't going to bring home any new plants, especially not an Ethereum, but I couldn't resist when I saw this at Lauren's uh, shop for the Equi not Equigenera, Tropicals Plants pop-up. So this is sold as a Anthurium twinsa, twinsia or twinsa velvet. That's not a thing. <laughs> That's what they're calling it. But I tried to find anything online that I could about this thing and I found nothing. The closest thing that I found was this name that I can't remember, but I'll throw it up here. And they're basically saying it's like an Anthurium sagittatum, but velvety. 
and I, I do see the resemblance for sure. I, I see a lot of like Kuna. I, I liked it because it had very Kuna um, venation. I don't know if I'd ever own a Kuna, not out of choice, just just acquirability. I don't know if that would ever, you know, come into my collection ethically. Um, so this kind of scratches that itch, but I don't really feel comfortable calling it like what it was sold as because I just don't think that's an accurate ID. If you Google it, it doesn't exist. It's like non-existent. So I'm not really sure what to call this thing, but I love it a lot. It's got like the funkiest little leaf. Um, it's still in the vessel that it came in when it was imported. I haven't like checked the roots. I haven't done anything. So we got to get this out of here before it's too late. Wow, that was the longest intro ever. So um, I'm going to get set up here. And uh, I do have a new filming table. I actually have two new filming tables. So remember you guys, I, I used to have that really big square like card playing table. That was way too big. I don't know what I was thinking. So I have purchased these two little like, they're not really like laptop tables. They're just like, I don't know, these little pop-up tables. It came in a pack of two. I'm gonna link it in the description because I just feel like every household needs this. It's so easy to be stored away and I've used it so many times. Obviously I'm using it for filming now. It's gonna be so much easier to like give you guys a better view of things because you're not so far. But I use this to like fold laundry. Um, there was one day where like I popped on a movie in the living room. I brought one of these tables out there, had my watering can, had everything I needed. And it was just like so easy to like do the things I needed to do without having to walk over to my dining table or walk over to the kitchen. And it's just so portable. So. If you're looking for a good table to do your plant things and you want to be able to store it away i highly recommend these anyway yeah gonna get set up and then we're gonna get straight into the collab okay so i'm gonna be starting with the dark phoenix since uh this one is gonna be chopped and i want to give it time to callus up and more than likely i'm going to be trimming off all roots because i can see some nasty roots in here yes it has drainage holes and uh, if you guys don't believe me, I rot more things with drainage holes than without. So that's another reason why I grow with no drainage because I'm just like, I don't know what it is. Drainage holes and me, we just like don't jive. So I don't know if moving all of my Ethereum to drainage holes is a problem or is gonna be an issue, but we're going with it. I don't know why I always have the urge to smell it. Okay, it doesn't smell like anything. All right, we're gonna jump into the first question. So number one is, if you could only give three pieces of advice to all plant parents in terms of care, what would it be? I feel like this is a very dif difficult question because there's like, if I had to answer this, I feel like I would post like a three hour long video. But her answer was like nice and short and sweet. And I'm not even gonna be letting you listen to the voice note because it was that short. She basically said, do what works for you and stick with it. And don't forget to experiment and observe. I think that that is great advice because I have definitely learned more through experimentation than anything I've learned online through other people, through friends, whatever it may be. She's a hot mess already. Um, and even though it's not fun to fail and like, you know, especially if it's like a plant that you really like and costs a lot of money, I feel like you learn the best when you fail because you just, I don't know, it sticks with you. You know what I mean? Obviously, I, I, I wish that I didn't <laughs> fail. That would be nice because I probably have much nicer plants um, than I do now. But anytime I do fail, I just, it really does stick with me. And I feel like I'm able to like assess parts of that situation that I maybe wouldn't have given a second thought to otherwise. And yeah, it's, it, I think it really is important to be sort of like present with your plants, observe them, like really observe them. You know, don't just look for like new leaves and, and things like that. Like you really have to like art, look at the roots, you know, observe it when you do fertilize it. 
know what it looks like when it's thirsty, know what it looks like when it's hydrated. There's just like so much that you can learn from a plant just by like taking the time to observe it. And I think if I didn't really take the time to observe a lot of the plants that I have now, um, they probably would not be in my collection anymore. The roots on this sucked, obviously. You could see there were a lot of dead roots, but there are some nice ones coming in. This chunk is actually like way smaller than I thought it was gonna be. It's still chopping size, but there's no way I'm gonna get three out of this, nor do I really wanna risk it. But I do think that I can get two. So the leaf is gonna go, chopping this guy off. I just need to find a good spot here to, to chop. So I'm gonna just go right here and, oops. And I'm actually feeling pretty good about that. It's two, like, I would say decent size chonkaronis. Um, so I'm going to just let this chill out for the time being. I can see some new roots on this one right here. So I'm going to just stick this in this wet uh, pond that I dumped out so that it doesn't dry out while it's callousing. And uh, I'll get back to this at the very end. Hopefully I don't throw this out thinking it's trash. I'm really anxious to see what the roots look like on this one, so I'm gonna do this one next. And then we're gonna move on to the next question. So question number two. Oh, no, I have a 1A here. So what do you wish you knew when you started your plant journey? This is another one that was a really short answer, so. She just said that she would learn more through experience rather than what she learned from other people or what she learned through research. So I know I say this a lot on my channel and I probably sound like a broken record at this point. Sorry, that's loud. But I always say like, do your own research. Like don't take what I say at face value all the time, even if I'm showing you proof of things because that is my that is unique to my experience and i don't think that there's any problem sharing your experience with people but i also don't think that like you should run with that right away just because you saw that this one person can do it or whatever so i think that there's always going to be sort of like a good balance between doing your own research and also learning through your own experience like honestly if you go to any i feel like this table could be a little higher I feel like if you go to any sort of like gardening website and you ask for specific care on something, a lot of this stuff, it's like very generalized and um, it like advises things that like I truly would like never do. And like, let's say that I had like no foot in the game and I was completely brand new and I just took all this advice at face value because I thought it was like a reputable website and like should be trusted. I honestly, I feel like I would be in a lot of trouble. And not only that, it's like a lot of the times these websites that are giving care advice is just really vague. Um, I'm not saying that it's always wrong because that's not true either. Like I still like, you know, if I don't know the care about something, like I'll go to a website because I'm just like, I want to at least have some bones to work with, get like any kind of information I can, but still kind of like go with my instincts as well. And so if you're using like YouTube videos as a form of research, I commend you because to me, it kind of shows that you really do want to take the time to learn because it's so much, it's so much more <laughs> like of an investment to like watch a video, especially a long one, rather than just like find that quick recipe you're looking for on a website, you know what I mean? Um, but I do think that it's valuable and I do think that it's important to kind of gather, yes, gather the information you need from sources that you trust, but don't downplay the power of like your own experience. And like, I will just like never stop saying that because I do a lot of things that are against the grain and against what people would advise and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I'm not saying that like I never make mistakes because I do. I make lots of them. This petio looks so dry, but the, the leaf itself feels really like firm. Anywho, um, here's the root sitch. 
it's not wonderful but it's also not the worst i am going to be chopping a bit of it off especially the parts that have turned black you're really far you're very far actually so anyway like amanda said learn more through experience and don't basically don't like too heavily rely on the advice from other people or what you read online and sometimes it's really hard to decipher like what's anecdotal advice versus like what's actually like studied and proven you know what i mean and even with studies that are proven it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you have to do i think the fun of this hobby is just kind of like going with your own rhythm and like like following your instincts and stuff so I do like that advice. Part of me wants to chop this because I feel like this is a plant that would be shared amongst my friends. I mean, I don't know what the interest is, but like, look at this stem. It's so long. I don't normally like chopping though, right when I import because I just feel like it adds more to the stress of the plant, um, but whenever I do get an import, my expectation is that I'm gonna lose the import leaf. It's not always the case. I have import leaves on plants that have been on the plant for almost four years. <laughs> I'm talking about my my big uh, philodendron Billetia. I have that massive leaf that's like the size of my torso, maybe even bigger, and I was expecting that leaf to drop like a week after I picked it up and it's still on the plant. So again, I expect leaves to fall off, but when it doesn't, I'm not like super surprised either. And what I mean is that like, you kind of have to assess like, is it worth keeping this leaf or would I rather get a propagation from it is the question. And I don't really necessarily want such a massive chunk in my vessel because I'm going to be putting it in here. But at the same time, sorry, I'm just kind of taking you through my, my thought process. At the same time, if I do um, leave it like this, it's gonna outgrow this pot fairly quickly once the roots get going. And so I think maybe at that point, it would be a better time to chop it. Hmm. What would Jesus do? You know what? I'm just gonna leave it. I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to disturb it too much, but I am going to just clean up this chunk a little bit because it's just in my DNA to do that. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. Um, this one is, what is your substrate of choice? And for this question, she said that it was either lechuzapon or a tree fern fiber mix. And I do have a video to show you. In this mix, it looks like she's got um, some soil, some tree fern fiber, some fir bark, coarse perlite, and I think what is also in here is something called turfus clay, and it's really commonly used in the bonsai hobby. It's basically like a high-fired calcined clay that holds a lot of water but also adds acidity to the soil mixture. I believe that is what it is, um, and I do think that she answers this question more in depth later. I just can't remember right now, but it says that her choices in general are typically lechuzapon or a tree from fiber mix. And uh, there's a second part to this question and it was, what are substrates that you avoid and why? And I do have a voice note for this one, the first one ever. And please enjoy Amanda's voice. She always makes fun of her voice, but I love her voice. I avoid pre-bagged like peat-based soil just because I had a terrifying fungus gnat outbreak years and years ago from a bird of paradise that I purchased from Home Depot. Since then I've steered clear, but I do know a lot of growers who have success with just like 50-50 potting soil, like miracle Grow and Perlite. This one, I've seen some like pretty feisty arguments in plant groups about like what the best soil mix is. I think someone had posted like, oh, this is just a PSA that like, you know, you guys don't need all that fancy substrate and all that expensive overpriced soil mixes because I just use miracle Grow and it's totally fine and um, man I have not seen such a heated debate before it's really interesting things that um, people get pressed about in terms of like 
people's preferences. Um, I will say though that my the only issue I can see with this with that post is that like if there was like a completely new plant parent that was like reading it and was like, oh, I'm just gonna use Miracle Grow then. I, that to me is like maybe you should add a little bit more information or like show the plants that you're growing in it. Um, give a little bit more context, you know what I mean? Every plant parent is responsible for again doing their own research and not just taking, you know, quick advice from someone, especially if it's a stranger. But uh, I do think that there should be maybe a little bit of responsibility on a poster's part and really keeping in mind that there's going to be such a large demographic that reads your comment and your post or whatever. But anyway, um, like she said, she would avoid peat um, heavy soil mixes or like pre bag mixes like miracle Grow, And I tend to agree. I think that with the bag of soil that I just bought, it wasn't miracle Grow or anything, but it was just like a really cheap bag. And my fungus net issue exploded. Um, I did not have as bad of fungus gnats when I was growing primarily in pond. And when I was using a little bit more of a expensive mix that was geared towards tropical plants, the soil that I have is like straight soil. Like you could like plant a cedar tree in it and it would be fine outside. Um, so I don't think that I would ever do that again. I was really just trying to cut costs, but like Amanda said, the fungus gnat thing with those kinds of uh, bagged soils, I've certainly had that issue as well. I don't think that you guys will be able to tell, but this thing is like, look at how wobbly it is because it's so limp. There is like no water in here at all. So what I'm gonna do is actually just soak this in water for the time being and uh, during the duration of this video, it'll be able to like take in some water and then I will maybe save this for the end to repot as well as my Dark Phoenix stumps. Um, okay, next one is, oh, perfect timing. So the next question is, what is your favorite anthurium and why? My anthurium papillolaminum RE5, it came from a Florida greenhouse that was constantly under a mist bench with extremely hot temperatures and it never really threw a fit even though it went through an extreme environmental change to my home which was much cooler and lower humidity and it's just been a very strong grower. So the RA5 is definitely like a beautiful plant. I do tend to kind of get <laughs> mixed up with a lot of the anthurium that kind of look like this especially when you've got like different kinds of paps right like to me they're very very similar a lot of them but there are certain forms that i would say i gravitate toward um but i don't necessarily need all of them i feel like all of these like cool paps i can appreciate in other people's collection or just you know seeing photos of them on online i don't necessarily need all of them but this one is actually really cool and you can tell how much amanda loves it just based on how many photos she's taken of it over the years anyway i know you're still looking at her pictures but i am unpotting my ra5 swamp and the roots look really good it kind of sucks because i just watered these yesterday so everything is like really wet right now and it's like sticking everywhere but it's looking really good. The stem is actually quite choppable, but I'm not gonna be touching it because I just want this thing to grow. I don't really need another clone of this. I don't really, I'm not itching to like sell a cutting of this. I really just kind of want to see it, you know, grow up and live to its fullest potential. So this one will not be chopped today. There are two other questions that I kind of grouped under this question. So. The next one is, what do you feel is an underrated slash underappreciated anthurium? That's kind of hard because I feel like over the years, certain plants become somewhat hyped, I guess you could call it. But I would say overall, I think pure anthurium crystallinum is the most underappreciated. I've said this before, and I think me and Alice have gone on like this anthurium crystallinum crusade in the past. But I, I have to agree with this wholeheartedly. I feel like because the crystallinum is so common that it, it tends to get really like overlooked, 
um, as not a really special plant, but I think if you take the time to really like appreciate its features, it really is just as special as a lot of the more sought after ones that are like really trending and hyped right now. The crystallinum, just depending on which kind of specimen you get, and I'm just, I'm not even talking about like the crystallinum super special or the crystal dark or crystal black or whatever. Um, I'm just talking about like a good old crystallinum. Like, they have some of, like, it has some of the most, like, striking venation where it's, like, not even just, like, silver venation. It can just be, like, basically white because it's so bright. It's got, that, like, that nice, crisp venation to it, too. It looks like just such a clean, like, a clean anthurium. I don't know how else to say it. It grows so well. Uh, it doesn't really require much. And it's so funny that I'm saying this, and I don't have a regular crystal I'm in crystallinum in my collection but i think i'm gonna change that i think i need to like i, I need a crystallinum i need a crystallinum again so yeah i definitely agree with her i feel like the crystal just doesn't get the love that it deserves unfortunately i forgot to inoculate this but i will just use gray white okay crisis averted sometimes you can find some really really cool um mutations of crystallinum too um, I've seen like a few crystallinums come out of a batch and they can all be so different and I don't know they're just really really fun and I know that like it's kind of as saturated as like the Lux hybrid now like there's so many crystal hybrids out there but I just will never get tired of it I will never get tired of it because crystallinums have some of like the best anthurium features and it just deserves more love all right this guy is in i'm actually feeling really good about the size and i'm just going to be sticking it into this clear vessel to catch the water because i do want to leave a bit of a reserve down there um but yeah she is done next question is are there any anthurium you find ugly or would never buy so I'm just gonna answer this one for her. She said that she does not enjoy the bird's nest anthurium, for example, like a hooker eye or a superbum. I I don't like those at all. Not that I find it to be like ugly, but the growth pattern I just don't jive with. But she also said, never say never. I think that there have been so many times where I've had to like eat my words because I'll say like, oh, I would never own that plant ever ever i hate that plant it's so ugly and now it's like one of my most prized plants two plants that i can think of off the top of my head one the alocasia cupria used to be just wildly freaked out by that plant um i just thought it was a little bit too creepy and that's coming from a person who loves horror and halloween and all things creepy it just creepy in a like bad way but after growing it from a small plant it really just grew on me and now it's one of like my staple alocasia another one is the anthurium vicii i really did not enjoy this plant before again i thought it was creepy and not in a great way but um i i want to say i blame alice i blame alice and i also blame the instagram algorithm for showing me so many beautiful vicii on my explore page i gave into that now my VGI Super Nero is one of my prized plants and I just like can't wait to grow old with that thing. So yeah, never say never. But I, I really, I feel confident that I would never have um, a bird's nest anthurium in my house. I just don't see it happening. I'm way more cognizant now of like how things will grow long term in my space and how it's actually going to work. And I'm not as like impulsive as I used to be in terms of bringing plants home. Um, even when plants are offered to me for free, I like can make that assessment and know what like the right decision is, you know? So yeah, for me, I feel like it's gonna be a never for me for the bird's nest anthurium. No offense if you like them, it's just not, it's just not my thing. I'm gonna give this a little wiper down. Haven't seen any spider mites in my anthurium cabinet at all but you know we're being preventative now because i'm just trying to be smart as a reminder this is a mixture of the dr woods peppermint and tea tree cast aisle soap plus 99 is it 99 percent 
99 or 90 percent alcohol it's really strong isopropyl alcohol and which reminds me i i got a comment today saying like oh i would be careful using the spray because um dogs are like the essential oils are toxic to dogs and that is a good point they it is i actually had quite a scare with pudge a few years ago with one of my vix humidifiers it was one of those like you stick a little pad in it like a menthol pad and it like puts all this like vix hum uh vix vapor into the air i didn't even think twice about it with pudge because like throughout his entire life up until that point i was running um diffusers like crazy in my house i was a diffuser girl i loved my house smelling like essential oils and he never ever had a reaction to it but this humidifier was just like next level it was so strong it was right in our bed and um yeah we almost lost him we had to rush him to the ER, er vet and literally he was like getting cold in my arms it's still one of those like PTSD moments for me like I still to this day whenever I'll, I'll just like see him I'll just like touch him and make sure he's warm because I just have such a like trigger from from that experience so it is a good point but I'm not worried about using this spray with my plants because I'm really never doing any plant stuff with this when he's around and the amount that's in here is not enough to affect him and he also doesn't touch my plants at all. I could literally shove a plant in his face and he'd be like, oh, get away from me. So um, yeah, I'm not worried at all. But if you do have like cats or I don't know if these essential oils are toxic to cats, but yeah, I, I guess I would just be cautious or I should say be cautious if you do have pets that like to nibble on your plants. I'm not sure if like the small amount of trace um, essential oils on the leaves will be enough to harm them but better safe than sorry anyway there's that tangent so we're moving on to the next question we asked her what is your favorite philodendron and why probably my philodendron scott morianum i got it as a two-leaf cutting a few years ago which has now become about a 12 foot tall probably six foot wide tree i'm most likely going to be donating it to Garfield Park Conservatory because I don't have the heart to chop it and it's just about to the top of my ceiling. Her Scott Morianum is truly massive. Like, no joke. It is like a fixture in her house. It is huge. It is taking up so much of that wall. And if you'll believe it or not, that thing I believe is growing off a nail. And what I mean by that is she ties, and I, I think she talks about this later in another question, but she uses like string, suede string specifically, and she just ties the stem to the wall, like a nail in the wall, and that's her support for it. She doesn't use moss poles and all that. So, and it's gotten as big as it's gotten indoors, which is insane. But I kind of understand her reasoning and not wanting to chop it. I personally am not she's not scared of chopping plants but i think that's probably one of those plants where it's like it's gotten to a point where it deserves to be like in a conservatory and it would be such a waste if she just like hacked the leaves off to start over it's way too big to ship if someone wanted to buy it so i get it like i think at that point if i've enjoyed it up to a certain point i don't see why i would be hesitant to um to donate it because then other people can enjoy it too but it is beautiful it's very beautiful the only reason I don't, I've not like looked or sought one out is because I get, I get that itch scratched with the billy. I feel like I used to just be like any long leaf philodendron, I have to have them all. And at one point I had many of them and it was just too much. So again, I have to decipher like what's, you know, what is something that I can enjoy from afar and like which ones are the ones that I really want to bring home. Next question is, Favorite hybrid you've ever created? Probably my Magnificum Luxurians because it was the first Luxurians hybrid that I created. And at that time, shockingly, there weren't any Luxurian hybrids available. But shortly after I started selling the seedlings, Equigenera released a bunch. So unfortunately, that excitement dwindled a bit. I had never seen a Lux hybrid before until it was introduced to me by Amanda. The Maglux, I think from my recollection, this one has not as dark of a leaf as like the crystal, 
what is it mag crystal lux i think it has a bit of a greener leaf like a lighter green leaf with lighter green venation um but you know it's beautiful and i do have one i showed you guys mine it doesn't look the best but actually now like looking at her her leaves hers actually is much darker it's a lot darker than some of the mag luxes that i've seen online and I like that it has such a like a buttery like leaf texture. It's not like super super shiny, but shiny enough where you can see like the glitter of it. Uh, obviously, when you have a plant that comes out of a seed batch, you know it's gonna vary. It's not all gonna be the same. So I am kind of interested to see what mine will look like. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool seeing all the Lux hybrids only because. I mean, I like the Lux so much. I think it has a lot to offer in terms of a parent plant. But I am just a little bit put off by Equigenera giving it such specific names, like the Raven's Heart or whatever. People can do what they want, but I'm team like, just name it what the hybrid is because it makes it less confusing, especially for someone like me who's just constantly mixing up my freaking Ethereum names like I don't need it to be any more complicated than it already is I'm Trying to rip off this This ugly price tag Okay, so while I'm just doing that Let's move to the next question because I'm actually finding that I'm plowing through these way faster than I'm getting through the questions Do you have any non aeroids? I like this one because there was like in the beginning of our friendship when we were still getting to know each other You know, she would send me like videos of this and that and I did notice like in the background She'd like walk by and there would be like a cactus or a ficus and I'm just like, oh my gosh She has non aeroids and I wonder what they are. So um, Yeah, she does have a few I have a desert rose, a few cacti, a euphorbia, begonia, a jade, sephora pastrata, and a weeping blue willow. I would say from what I've seen, a majority of her, um, her non-aeroids live on like a windowsill. And I mean, it makes sense because a lot of them, you know, can take full sun and things like that. I think of all of her non-aeroids, if I could pick one to add to my collection, they are all really cute um i think it would definitely be the prostrata because it reminds me of my dicaria matagariensis and it's just so cute i think my neighbor downstairs used to have a really big one of this like a whole tree and i used to like peek over at it <laughs> over my other friend's balcony and just admire it because it was so beautiful but she told me recently that winter Winter took it away. I think, um, you know, she would overwinter it or she would like wrap burlap around the plant over the winter so that it wouldn't get frost. And she had it for quite a while, but we had one year where it was just so incredibly cold that I'm not surprised that it, that it passed on. But it's too bad, it's such a cute plant. All right, moving on, we're getting into like the good stuff now. So this one is, do you have any advice on growing seedlings and what is your favorite germination method? So when I first started, I used to use moss, but I quickly realized when I had to separate them, untangling the roots was a mess. So now I use tree fern fiber. Sometimes I'll mix it with pond or just use it straight. And I make sure that it's in an enclosed container, deli container, whatever you have remove the lid after one to two leaves and make sure you give it high light and start feeding diluted as soon as the first leaf pops. I had a conversation with Amanda one day about seedlings and like how she grows seedlings because when I was, um, you know, dealing with my batch of like a hundred seedlings, which was such a nightmare. I, I personally don't like tending to seedlings. I think it's a lot of work. It's like, taking care of, of a bunch of newborns. But, you know, she was telling me that like, she removed the the plants from its like little dome situation after it's popped like two leaves. And for me, I was like, how? Like, how did you do that? Because mine, like the second I take off the lid, it's like, like melted, wilted spinach. 
I think one thing that I remember about that conversation is that she doesn't want to send out like weak seeds so she wants to make sure that they're like not like fully acclimatized but they're not like these in in vitro um kind of like tissue culture you know how it's so tedious when you're transitioning out a tissue culture plant out of its like little in vitro bottle which is why i've never grown from tc before i just don't i just don't trust myself with that process i find it's almost the same thing with seedlings they have such specific watering and humidity requirements when you grow them in like that perfect little vessel and yeah so i was just surprised that she took them out that early because i'm like oh my gosh that much that must be so much work taking care of like thousands and thousands of seedlings that you know are transitioning from high humidity into lower humidity and I don't know if like the feeding has anything to do with it because I did not feed any of my seedlings fertilizer until it had a leaf that was like this big. Like I really wasn't feeding it, which in hindsight, I probably could have fed it because it was like growing so fast, you know? Um, but you heard it from Amanda herself. She uh, transitions early and she she feeds pretty early too. It's so weird to see this tiny little plant in such a big vessel, but I have faith that we're gonna try so hard. I'm gonna try so hard. I'm really gonna like hone in my inner Jesse. I feel like I can do it. It's gonna be fine. I just have to get used to it and make sure that it is getting adequate light. I'm gonna make sure that it's not sitting under a leaf and like it's fully exposed to light so that you know there's not too much water sitting in here i could have also probably done leka down at the bottom now that i think about it actually <laughs> dang it dang it now that i think about it i think i do want to do that so i'm going to take this out and we're going to move on to the next question are there any plants that you struggle with anthurium debile or debilis probably the only anthurium i cannot keep happy or grow in my conditions and philodendron melanochrysum and philodendron lupinum always a struggle so she showed me a video once and i tried to find it so that i could insert it but she did a time lapse of i think it was her debilis that she took out of its greenhouse or its cloche or whatever it was in and like in a span of this time lapse it just turned into wilted spinach. I personally love the debilis and hopefully I'm saying this right. I don't know if it's debile or debilis, but I've always said debilis. Um, I love this plant because it reminds me so much of the Anthurium circus penis. <laughs> I almost said Anthurium circus penis because I call it that jokingly and now it's stuck. <laughs> You see, Sherman, this is the consequences of your actions. Anyway, um, yeah, it reminds me of the Anthurium Circus Peanuts, which is wildly out of my budget and will be for the next foreseeable future. But, you know, you always see the Debilis on um, import lists. And how many times, I can't even count how many times I've had to, like, hold myself back because I know... I know I would be terrible at growing this thing. I do have friends that grow the debilis, and I think I even have one friend, I think my friend Jose grows his debilis outside of a greenhouse, which I don't know what kind of sorcery he is uh, performing in the vicinity of his four walls, but I do not have that capability, nor do I really like believe that I can grow the debilis well. And it would be one that I would treat, want to treat no differently than the rest of my anthurium and have living eventually, you know, on my plant shelf. So that's one that's just not going to work. But I just think it's such a cool anthurium for sure. Um, I just have had to hold back because of its notoriety in terms of being a very finicky guy. And if Amanda struggles with it, I feel like there is no hope for me. I talked about the Milano Chrysum earlier this week in my plants that have come and gone um, and I really should have included the lupinum in that video too because I have owned I think two lupinums and I, I just feel like it's hard to size up a lupinum in the conditions that we have if it's not like outside in its like native habitat or something it's just difficult especially if you're starting from a small plant 
and for me same goes with the Milano Chrysum. I'm not going to get too much into why that plant is so difficult for me you guys can give that video a watch but it kind of sounds like Amanda's on that same boat too. So um, I'm glad that I opted for the Leca down at the bottom because now I can keep some water down here. And um, yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling okay about this. I don't feel like wonderful just because it's in such a large vessel, but you know, we're gonna try everything once. Do you have any tips on growing aeroids outside of a greenhouse? I'm going to speak primarily on anthuriums because that's mostly what I grow. And I feel there's a bit of a misconception when it comes to anthuriums. Instead of anthuriums require high humidity in order to thrive, I think a better term would be that they require hydration in order to thrive. So if the humidity is pretty low, as long as the plant is able to stay hydrated through the root system, I think they'll be okay. Um, for me, I try to avoid the substrate from completely getting bone dry and self-watering or semi-hydro has been my best friend. And food, love, light, and patience. Super, super solid advice. I would say, um, you know, I got sort of the same spiel because if you guys didn't know, Amanda was the one that sort of helped me in my journey to um, growing my anthurium outside of a greenhouse. And what she said in that last bit is like patience. She was not joking. I really, I knew that it was gonna be like a difficult journey. I knew that it wasn't gonna be like a walk in the park, but I certainly wasn't expecting the experience that I got. And that's just because, you know, like so many of my Ethereum almost looked like it was just taking its last breath. <laughs> And um, I am glad that I stuck it out, but it was a, it was quite a painful process. I'm not gonna lie. Um, would I do it again just to be able to grow my anthurium outside of a greenhouse? Absolutely. But I will really allude to what she's saying and um, you know confirm that it does take a lot of patience. Like you really can't expect overnight results. To no one's surprise, the. Uh, Pat port did not have great roots and a lot of it has rotted off. My inkling is that this tree fern fiber, this came from Alice and it's a little bit denser than what I'm used to. Um, I usually mix like a lot of, uh, not pond, well yeah, pond, uh, perlite into it and it looks like this one has just pond and it was sitting at the bottom of my Millsbo cabinet where it's not getting a ton of light. And so I think it just, you know, the perfect storm. Too much water in there from me overwatering it and then not having drainage holes, it being a more dense substrate. Uh, and then yeah, no light. But luckily the stem is looking really good. I do see some new roots on it, which is a good sign. So I'm just gonna opt for this little guy and I'm not going to be doing like moss or anything. I'm not going to be doing just perlite. I still want to stick with something that has tree fern fiber because I believe in that substrate with Ethereum. So we're just going to go with this. I'm just going to make sure that in my cabinet, I place it a little bit higher. My thought when I'm placing my Ethereum in my cabinet is that anything that has a pap in it, I just feel like it can grow under much darker sort of like understory conditions so it doesn't need to be at the top of the Millsbo where it's getting a lot of direct light um, but I do think that you know you still have you're still like messing with the elements and you have to make sure that your your balance of light and water ratio is just right because um, things can go awry really fast but I'm, I'm feeling okay about it. You know, this leaf hasn't died back or anything. It's still feeling really firm. And like I said, I saw some new roots. And so I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna be good in this. And now we've got drainage holes. I don't have to keep this substrate super wet. I can just keep like a reserve down at the bottom to like wick some of it up. So I'm feeling okay. Um, sort of backpacking on this question. Do you have any plants that cannot grow outside of a greenhouse? Yes, Anthurium debile, debilis, however you would like to pronounce it. It can live outside of 100% humidity, but I will see if I still have my time-lapse video of when I took it out of a propagation bin and I just showed how 
I think Alice also put it in one of her videos, but within 20 minutes or so, you could see the leaf just completely shrinking and melting away. So it can live outside in high humidity. However, it most likely will not thrive. Okay, so I totally forgot she actually sent me this video and I seriously spent like, I wanna say two hours searching through our media and our group chats looking for it. So. I mean, you know, it's a happy ending because you guys still get the video, but now I feel like I'll never get that time back. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, just quickly going over this question again. The Debilis is just one that I think that she, I don't know if she still has it or if it's still growing in a greenhouse, but I, I feel like she probably is not going to attempt to grow it outside of a greenhouse. Um, and I think that's fine. You know, sometimes like you really, I, I feel like in this hobby, we kind of manipulate nature in ways where sometimes it's a little questionable, especially in this house, that's for sure. But I do think there are some things where mother is like, nope, that, we, that will not fly. <laughs> this is not gonna work, this is not gonna end well for you. So that's just one of them. Okay, the next question is, what is your pest prevention and control? I am pretty aggressive whenever I receive a new plant, regardless of who it came from, how large it is, how small it is, the history of it, it doesn't matter. I remove all the media upon arrival. I completely submerge the entire plant, the roots, foliage and all, and I give it a what I call a swamp water bath. It's just a big tub filled with either diluted Azimax or Spinosad. And I let it soak for about 30 minutes and then I pot it up in new media and quarantine it for a few months before I take it out and reintroduce it to my collection. That's the only enclosed space I have is my Millsbo cabinet that is mainly used for quarantining new plants that I receive. If there's one thing I can tell you about Amanda for sure is that she does not mess around when it comes to pests. I can vividly remember one day where she texted me and Alice and like she just showed us this big garbage bin full of plants. Like she had just gone and like chopped off like I want to say 70% of the leaves in her collection because I think she said she found one, it was a spider mite or a thrip, it was one of them. I want to say it was a spider mite. She found it on one plant and she just the entire collection suffered the consequences because she spent that entire day chopping leaves off, bringing each one tediously to the bathroom and giving it a soak in like her swamp water like she was saying to you guys. Um, and yeah, she is just extremely, extremely on high alert when it comes to pests. She doesn't mess around with them. I feel like my personality is I've kind of succumbed to the fact that like I will always have pests and I know that's kind of a pessimistic outlook on it but that's just been my experience and I don't really expect it to change anytime soon. I truly believe I live in a high pest area because you know I'm part of a group of 8,000 people and it seems like we're always all struggling with the same kinds of pests so I know it's not just me. Anyway all that said yeah, she has a pretty rigorous process in terms of, um, I would say, quarantining plants for one and then treating for, for pests. Uh, she's a little bit more hardcore for sure. Like I used to not be the type of person that would immediately start hacking off leaves. That would actually be like my last resort. And I did that for a few years. I would really just spend the time to take them all to the shower, give them treatments week after week. And it was, it was crippling, honestly. The labor that it took to treat these plants, it was crippling. And at some point I just wised up and was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And now I'm just like team chop the leaf off and start over because the stress of dealing with an infestation is not worth those leaves to me. It's just not. Um, you know, I have to just keep reminding myself that plants grow back and it's not the end of the world. And Amanda has really sort of like coached me into that mentality. And I've been so much better for it. No matter how much backlash I get, 
from chopping leaves off i to me i need it for my mental health i cannot do that route anymore where i'm just like constantly hauling hundreds of plants to the shower i just can't do it you know she quarantines her plants way longer than i quarantine my plants i think my max for quarantining now is probably like two weeks and then i'm over it and i'm like you know what i'm tired of you sitting in this corner i'm just gonna put you on the shelf and that's probably like not smart of me because you know i'm trying to get better at like this whole pest thing but with my limited space i just can't afford to like have a random plant sitting in a corner of a room that's getting in the way. One thing I will say is that if you are dealing with thrips, spinosad is your best friend. Um, I am not going to be advising on how to get it into Canada because that is illegal, but if you're in the States and you're dealing with thripes, um, get yourself some spino. Like, that stuff is magic. And I don't even worry about thrips anymore. I had thrips couple months ago i think it was like i think my last thrip problem was yeah six or seven months ago i just i remembered that i had spino used it twice never saw another one ever again it's been it's been quite a while but these freaking spider mites man they just love it oh i forgot i was gonna check to see if there was a growth point i can't tell if this is the start of a new root or if it's an auxiliary bud on this red crystal but Either way, um, I think it's better that I've gotten these into like smaller vessels and in pots with drainage. And I did do a layer of Lekka down at the bottom. Oh, I'm gonna give these a wipe down too. All right, next question. Do you only grow with drainage? <laughs> Let's see what she has to say. Yes, because if you grow in no drainage, all your plants will die. I grow a lot of plants that are in self-watering pots, so I guess you could consider that drainage. However, some planters don't have inner pots to take them out and flush them, and a lot of plants have been in that setup for years with essentially no flushing, and they are still kicking. You heard the lady. She, doesn't, she didn't say verbatim that she grows without drainage holes, but she does have plants that basically don't have drainage. And I know the kind of uh, self-watering pot she's talking about. It's interesting that like some of them are made so that you like you can fill the water down at the bottom, but there's no way to actually remove it from that pot to like flush it out. Um, so yeah, it kind of just like is sitting in a drain or like a drainage holeless vessel. Um, but I would say that like she probably grows more with drainage you know she does this whole thing where she has pots with drainage and then sticks it into another vessel but i think it's just important like if i just had to give one piece of advice if you are going to be attempting to grow without drainage holes it's like just know know your substrate and know your conditions i know that's so broad um but you know i've made plenty of videos regarding how i grow with no drainage and the two just they go together like this, and you can't have one without the other, so. Can't have one without the other. Anyway, that one was quick. Any advice on pollinating and therium and things you've learned over the years? Have fun and observe. A benefit to being surrounded by my plants makes little observations pretty easy. Usually the first couple of inflorescences that an anthurium produces will be somewhat weak. In most cases, the inflows start producing more stigmatic fluid, which is the tiny droplets on the spadix. As the plant matures, making it much more easy to detect that it's receptive, meaning it's willing to take pollen. If you want a full set of seed, I recommend waiting until the spadix at least becomes three quarters of the way sticky. Experiences in my past of pollinating too early and then the plant started producing pollen resulting in a small seed batch. It's kind of a fine dance of allowing it to become fully receptive but not missing that point of when it starts producing its own pollen. I don't have a ton of experience in this. I've only ever done it once myself but I can understand like everything she's talking about. And um, I was extremely confused when I first, you know, attempted to pollinate two of my anthuriums. 
um, for the first time because it's like, like she said, there's like this fine dance or this fine line that you walk in terms of finding that perfect time to, you know, bump uglies. And so you, you really have to keep an eye on it. For me, I would rather pollinate early than late. It's pretty obvious to see when, you know, the plant becomes super receptive and yeah, you just see like all of those droplets, but it's not going to all come out at one time, especially if it's a large inflow. Um, you'll see that it typically starts at one end and then it like goes all the way down to the other end. But the thing is, is when you have such a massive inflow, sometimes by the time that the entire inflow will have produced the stigmatic fluid you might see that one end starts already producing pollen so i think what she said was like wait until like 70 percent or 75 percent has that fluid on it and then you can pollinate it you'll have a larger yield that way rather than trying to wait until the whole thing is sticky um, just because the timing might not work out like she also mentioned just sort of piggybacking on that I think um, something that I see in plant groups a lot, and, and I don't blame anyone for this because I was really, really uh, kind of anxious to s hybridize my own Anthurium as well. But I think when someone gets like an exciting plant, you know, they see the first inflow come in and they're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pollinate it. Like we're gonna make babies. And uh, the idea is nice, but sometimes depending on how large that specimen is, um, it's just too small. And those inflows are just too like too too baby to do anything with it whether it be to try and pollinate it or collect pollen i mean you could collect pollen but if your inflow is like this tiny it's you're not going to get much from it or if you try and pollinate it it's like maybe you'll get like one or two seeds and those seeds are probably going to be very weak you know for a lot of my plants that i really want to pollinate i have waited until like the third or fourth uh inflow has come out and right now i do have a Fertile, uh, she's pregnant right now. My Indo Pappy hybrid, which I love a lot. That one has pushed quite a few inflows for me in the past, but I felt like they weren't quite, the plant wasn't quite mature enough for me to like feel confident to pollinate it. So now that it's like much bigger and the inflow was like a really decent size, I was like, okay, I think now is the time. So I think another thing I would add to this is to just like be patient too, especially if it's like a hybrid that you really want, you know? And I don't know if this is like anecdotal or whatever, but you know, you I, I'm sure a lot of you have read that advice where like when an Ethereum is pushing out an inflow, it's like putting a lot of energy into that inflow and taking it away from the rest of the plant. So I tend to be very careful who I'm hybridizing. Like I would love to make like one lingerie babies, but at the same time, I don't know if I'd ever want to mother my plant because I just want it to focus on its foliage. But I think you kind of get to a point where you're like, okay, like I trust you, like I think you're gonna be fine. And one of those for me is my Hoff, my Hoff X, which is <laughs> at Lauren's again because we are going to be breeding it again. But that one, it's like, It'll push like two inflows and a leaf at a time and it's just like non-stop. The leaves are getting much bigger so that really hasn't been true for that plant and it's been living in the same substrate for like years. So anyway, you know, take, take this and that advice and do with what you will. But um, Amanda has created thousands and thousands of seedlings and I would trust her advice over pretty much anyone that I know. <laughs> Next one, do you struggle with light and which grow lights do you use? I wouldn't say I struggle with light. I have a really large east facing window so the plants that mostly rely on that kind of slow down during the winter. The lights I use are Sansy bulbs. I also use pendant lights like Soltec and Russo plants, my friend Tyler. I really like his lights because you can adjust the angle, the, the beam angle. So if you want it to be more narrow, you can screw it up and make it more of a tighter beam. Or if you want a wider beam, you can unscrew it. I know Alice has a Russo light. And one thing that she has said about that light is that it is extremely strong. So if you're looking for a really, really strong light, I would go with Russo. The color temperature is not as warm as the Soltec lights, which is why I went with Soltec. But I think now that I see the Soltec in my plant room, 
I think I probably wouldn't mind having a Russo light in here, especially since I can adjust the angle. That's one thing that I would consider like a plus in terms of, you know, buying over a, another brand or whatever. But yeah, uh, Amanda, she lives in like a loft. I think it's considered a loft. Yeah, it's a loft. She has grow lights all over the place. She has like shelves that have like bar lights. She has plants like around her media cabinet. And at the end, I'll show you a little peek into her space, but she's got like the, you know, pendant lights and whatever. So she's definitely utilizing a lot of different kinds of lights. Um, I did consult with her before investing in the lights that I have now. And she, yeah, she liked Soltech really solely for the color temperature and not that it like outperformed any other light that she has um because yeah the the soltech lights are really really pretty i will i will say that they're pricey they're really pricey i'm just hoping that you know they last a long time and i get my money's worth but so far so good honestly um i have one soltech in here this monstera above me which you can't see um it grows at a very very slow pace it's not a brazilian common form which i thought it was it's actually just a large form deliciosa and uh these ones tend to grow really slow like they don't push out as many leaves as the small form but um pretty much within like a week of putting it under a soltech light it pushed a new leaf so i don't know if that was coincidence but the timing of it just seemed really interesting so Anywho, that's that. How do you size up your anthurium so nicely? Light, food, water, most importantly, time. I'm sure that when some of you were asking some of these questions, you were like, I can't wait to hear the witchcraft that she uses <laughs> for her plants. But I'm not joking, you guys. Like, she's pretty much shared every product that she's used with, that she's used with me. And I'm using a lot of these products now. And I just, I do think a lot of it has to do with like the energy you're willing to, to put in and the effort you're willing to put in. And I think it just, you know, you have to be, you have to be patient. You have to get on a good regimen. I don't think that I've been on a good regimen with my anthurium, like I mentioned with the fertilization. I just feel like I've been lacking in that department. Um, and so I'm hoping now that my plants or my anthurium are mostly in pots with drainage. I still have quite a few that are in no drainage and I, I don't know, I feel like there's some that have just grown so well in it that I don't really feel the need to move it, but I, I know, I don't know, I might still. Um, but again, a lot of it is patience because I've had some of these anthurium for years and they were just growing so, so slowly. And I think now that I'm getting into a good rhythm, I'm starting to finally see some payoff, which has been really nice. So yeah, unfortunately, you know, she's not, she's not sharing any kind of special concoction that she uses or any kind of special spell that she uses to make her Ethereum so large. Um, it, that just is what it is. It's light water, patience, what did she say? Light water food, patience, and a little bit of TLC. This is a spur of the moment decision and some of you might not like it, but I think I'm gonna break this up into a two part video. I wasn't initially planning on doing that, but I am only halfway through the questions. I don't even think I'm halfway, but yeah, I'm halfway through the questions and there's still so much to get through and I don't wanna feel like I'm rushing it um, because she has a lot of good things to show you guys. Also, like I mentioned, I'm not feeling too hot and I don't want to push it or else I'm going to have to take another week off filming like I did that week that I didn't upload for an entire week, which felt like an eternity. And since I don't really have a ton um, scheduled for this month, I think, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll split it up into two. I won't wait too long between both of these parts. If anything, I'll maybe post second part next week. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna go through I'm gonna go through like three more questions and um, They're really short. We're just gonna get through those and I'm almost done here. Actually really the only other one that I need to do is my dark Phoenix stumps and I have Wasn't there another one that I needed to do? Oh, I have my Twinsa 
my Twinsa in in water and I actually think because it's so thirsty I think I'm gonna leave it in water for a few days and then I'm just gonna pot it into this same mix um, so I won't do that on camera so it really is just my dark Phoenix at this point that I need to get um, potted and there were a, quite a few other Ethereum I wanted to repot today but when I went to go grab them they were all pushing a new leaf and so, yeah, I don't want to mess with it when it's um, when it's got a new baby on the way. So at least I'll still have some other Ethereum to kind of show you guys and repot on camera. But yeah, sorry if you guys were expecting all the questions in this video. I just yeah, I'm not feeling I'm not feeling too hot. So the next question is, which info do you rely on slash trust for Ethereum care? And she said her own experience period. I think it's kind of hard, like if I had to answer this, I think it's kind of hard to find like really super reliable sources these days because articles that people have sent me in the past, like, I mean, yeah, there are like studies behind it and stuff, but I just, I don't know. I still feel like going with your gut is, that's like my preferred and it seems to be her preferred too. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. If you guys are not part of um, IAS, the International Aeroid Society, they have some really great um, information through through them. You just have to pay. It's a really cheap membership. That's really the only one that I could suggest right now. I do. I used to get a lot of my information from the enthusiast page on Facebook. You know, there's the Monster enthusiast, Ethereum enthusiast, Allocation enthusiast, and um, Again, this is no shade to like the admins or whatever, but I kind of feel like those groups have gone downhill this year. I don't know what happened. It went from being like a place where a lot of like prolific growers and botanists and stuff would share their wisdom and their experience. And lately it's become just kind of like a place for show and tell and also drama. Like I've seen so much drama on those pages lately where I'm like, what happened to the good old Ethereum or the good old en enthusiast page I used to I used to love so much so it's just not the same place anymore so I can't really recommend that anymore unfortunately but yeah IAS I would sign up if you've got it in your budget I honestly think it's like $15 for a year or something like that it's something it's something super super affordable from what I can remember I'm going to be putting both of the Dark Phoenix stumps into here and we're going to move on to the next question. So uh, it is, do you grow anything primarily in moss? And she says she doesn't. She only uses it to ship plants, primarily plants that have been growing in pond. Don't really know if I have anything else to piggyback on this. I used to grow a lot in moss and you guys will see that in some of my earlier um, YouTube videos. And for a while it was growing, it was it was okay, like it worked, but I did find that like long term, it was such a freaking hassle to um, repot and like get all the moss off of there. And when I would, you know, do these like invasive like untangling, the transition was just not it. It was just awful. Oh, that's soft under there. Let's see what's going on. So yeah, I just like really, really hate growing in moss now. And I used to, even this year, I was like, oh, I'm only gonna use moss to, um, you know, grow moss pole, like to grow on moss poles. But even now I don't like doing that because I don't like untangling the roots from the moss. Not that you have to, but sometimes like when I'm uh, extend, not extending a pole, but when I'm removing a, a plant from a pole, um, I like to open up the pole and remove some of the roots that have grown inside of the pole. And it's like nearly impossible to just like pull it out like that when it's growing in moss. So now I'm using moss as just kind of like an additive. Is that the right word? It's just an extra substrate that I'm using in my tree fern fiber. So I chop it up as much as I can and I mix it in because it really does help retain some of that water and promote root growth in there. I'm not like I, I do think moss still has you know properties to it that are super beneficial for rooting plants or and acclimatizing plants so I don't know if I'd ever be like completely moss free 
But in terms of using it as like a primary growing substrate, absolutely not. That ship sailed a long time ago and I could never do it again. Um, I really like this question. So it's how do you grow plants so large without moss poles? Um, I don't have an audio for this, but she says that support is the most important and it will eventually size up and mature as long as it feels supported and given light and nutrients. So when I think about her collection, the first thing that comes to mind, besides, you know, we just saw, saw the Scott Morianum, her Majestic is another one that is really a testament to um, how plants can have the will to size up without a pole, just given the right conditions and given the right support. And support doesn't always mean a pole. Um, for her, support is a piece of string tied to a nail on the wall. And her Majestic has gotten massive. She no longer has a Majestic. I think she was getting so overwhelmed with how fast it grew because the Majestic is a vigorous, vigorous grower. It has, it really does have like that hybrid vigor for sure. And she chopped it. In the time that I've known her, I think she's chopped that thing down to like basically, you know, a stump or whatever, like probably four times. And it has reached the ceiling multiple times during the course of our friendship. And I'm not talking like, you know, little tiny leaves. I'm talking leaves that are like maybe two times the size of my, my body. Um, like they're big. And she doesn't use any kind of fancy pole or anything. She really just has it the stem supported on the wall and that's it. And it's growing without grow lights, it's just growing in her east facing window and that's year round. So, you know, sometimes of the year, it's not gonna be as strong as others. I am a huge advocate for getting climbing plants on poles just because I don't have that same experience with her in terms of like being able to size up my plants that large without a pole. Um, although I will say that my Glorious has kind of started to show me that like it doesn't really need a pole anymore. Um, the last few leaves, it outgrew its pole. It wasn't really even holding on to anything and it's gotten significantly larger over the last few months. Um, I just give it a pole because to me it makes me feel more secure and makes me feel more confident that it will size up. Um, but then you've got people like Amanda who are just out here using some string from the dollar store. And you know, she's got these massive, massive plants in her house, which is actually quite magical. And yeah, that is where I'm going to cut it for today. Again, I will try and pick this back up as soon as possible. Um, maybe I'll try and get this in my schedule to film part two over the next few days. But I just, yeah, if there's one thing I've learned about being immunocompromised and like constantly having some sort of like sickness. It's just that like when I push it, I recover so much slower than like the average person. I'll be sick for like freaking months. I'm just gonna shove this guy in there. I'm hoping that I get something from this dark phoenix because I would be so bummed if nothing ever came out of these stumps this is giving this is not giving does it go that way oh yeah that's the bottom no wonder i was like why are the roots going up i can't pot it downward i almost planted it the wrong way thank goodness my brain cell kicked in so uh anywho guys i hope you enjoyed this part one of amanda's interview um again i'm trying my best here to do this collab from from far away, it's like when I knew that I wanted to collab with her, I'm like, but how? How are we going to do this? Um, I had thought about literally just having her on a FaceTime call and like filming, but I think that would have been too chaotic. The audio would have been terrible. So, um, you know, she sent me these voice notes and I, I could have easily just relayed this information to you, but I really wanted you to like hear it in her voice and hear it in her words for some of them. And... Um, yeah, hopefully you guys are getting some use out of it. If there's one thing that I've learned from Amanda, it's um, to just kind of like trust the process. And I think if you look at someone like Amanda and you look at the plant she has, you would think like she has a special recipe. She's doing something that 
you know, a lot of us are not doing, but really, she's really not. Um, if you really break down her process, you break down her logic and how she goes about caring for plants, it's kind of all the same. I just think the difference is that like she trusts her instincts and she goes with it now. She's patient and I think that she does have sort of a good routine with all of the substrates she's using and all the you know fertilizers and stuff she's using and I'm pretty sure I go into that as well. I talk about the different kinds of fertilizers that she uses and her myco and stuff so we'll get more into like the nitty gritty of her growing in part two. But yeah, I am done. I'm done and I'm feeling good. I feel like now maybe 70% of my Ethereum collection is in pots with drainage. Um, hopefully by the time I'm ready to film part two of this video that the new leaves will have emerged and hardened off. Um, so, and if they haven't, because I really want to be repotting Ethereum in these videos, the next part of this collab video might not go up until maybe the end of the month. So I'm sorry, but I just have to like work the timing out. And with these new leaves, sometimes you just can't predict how long it's going to take. Um, make sure you stay tuned for part two. I will definitely be getting it up in the month of November. I just don't know exactly when. Um, but again, thank you, Amanda, for being a part of this collab. Sorry that I couldn't get through all the videos, not the videos, <laughs> through all the questions. Um, but I tried to get through as much as I can and uh, hopefully it was enough to hold you over. So uh, if you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to follow Amanda on Instagram. One thing that I should say is that yes, she sells plants. I'm not sure if she's actively doing individual sales right now because of the weather but anything that she does sell is gonna be in her story, so just like keep an eye out for that. I do think that you can also message her. Um, just keep in mind, she does not ship to Canada. She only ships throughout the United States, so if you're international, please don't even like, cause she, she gets a lot of DMs, especially after like I post a video like this or Alice posts something about Amanda and um, We've just felt bad because she's like, you guys should see my my DMs, like they've blown up. So please only message her to inquire about plants if you're in the United States or you have a United States address that you can ship it to if you're in Canada. Um, be nice to her and be respectful. Don't spam her, please. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it. So thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next one.